Greetings, everyone, for this impromptu snack talk, I guess it is. With me is uh, a co-host for today's episode, the man I dragged to the movies with me, Ditaku. Konbanwa Ditaku des. Yes. D- D- Diet Tacos d- does. Anyway, we went and saw the Monster Hunter movie, which... Let me give you a bit of background. For people who aren't familiar with this, Paul W.S. Anderson is the director and Mila Jovovich is the main character of a Capcom license. If it sounds like you have been mysteriously transported to the mid-aughts and are talking about the Resident Evil film, have no fear. This movie is actually way better than those, and it's nowhere near as painful to watch. Well, okay, before we even get into that, just to kind of show off our credentials, why don't you... Explain, Professor, you know, your ex- your uh, experience with the Monhun franchise, and I'll do the same once you're done. Certainly. I actually got on board. I'm going to indict myself, so I, I hope everyone at home forgives me because this is going to land me yet another sentence in bad taste jail. I was one of the seven people on Earth who bought a Wii U. Oh, I think you've already admitted to it too much. It was the first paycheck. Yeah. <laughs> It was the first paycheck of a new job, and I was not going to do anything fiscally responsible with it, so I decided I would buy a new toy. And the newest toy on the market at the time was the Wii U, and among the very first games I picked up was Monster Hunter 3, on account that I had seen reviews of the franchise and had been curious about it, but hadn't acted on it up to that point. Basically, I picked up with 3 Ultimate, and I sucked at it. I was really, really, really bad because I kept trying to use the great sword and I was terrible with it. And I was even kind of afraid of Great Jaggy the first time I encountered it because I just did not understand how the game worked. Well, I sat down and I watched some tutorials and I'm like, oh, that's what I'm supposed to be doing. And I got better over time. By the time Monster Hunter 4 came out, I was actually halfway competent and I've been a fan ever since, really. Personally, I got on with 4 Ultimate because uh, my little brother and a couple of his friends started playing and they're like, dude, dude, Jitaku, you need to play this. You need to play this. You need to play this. And one of our friends, let's call him Bacon Bits, was really, really into the game. And uh, knowing how much of a dino abu he turned out to be, I can understand. I mean, and they're good games. But uh, yeah, I, I started as a longsword user, and I I'm still am a longsword user. And uh, all all you all you babies who kind of got on the longsword train with World, now that it's good, yeah, you don't know how it was in War Ultimate to get kicked out of hunting halls because you actually had a longsword back then. It was it was painful. So uh, that that's just my that's just my hipster hipster rant for the thing. <laughs> but anyways, we're not talking about the game so much as we're talking about the movie. And uh, yeah, so how was the movie, Professor? I have to say, I went into this very much... To go back to my Sonic the Hedgehog review for a moment, when I went to see it, I was like, this movie's going to be bad, but I'm going to be entertained. After having seen... I've watched every Resident Evil movie. You may pray for my immortal soul. So I went into this thinking this is going to suck and I'm not even going to have fun from it. But then I went in and they actually gave me a good movie, not an amazing movie, not a movie that will change your life or change your relationship with monster hunter, but a good movie. And I'm kind of blown away that it was as good as it was. Yeah. I'm kind of inclined to agree with you on that one. Um, I mean, yeah, my, my thoughts on Sonic were about the same. I'm like, this is not going to be a good movie, but it's going to be an enjoyable dumpster fire because it's Sonic and that's usually how it goes. And then I was kind of blown away when it was a legitimately good movie. This is not a legitimately good movie. It's, it's not a bad movie, but it's not, it didn't blow me away with like, oh man, it's like, this turned my entire thing around. The only film I've ever seen with Milia Jovic in it that actually I would say is legitimately good is The Fifth Element. And she barely speaks in it. She barely is in it. That goes back a ways, too. Yeah. So, um, and I mean, I, I can't say that I have the same relationship with the Resi movies as you did. I saw the first two. And then many years later, I'm like, wait, they're still making those? There's like how many of them now? They're still, they made them for, they, they made 
for a time, there was more resi films than there were mainline numbered resi games. That's not true anymore. But at the same time, it was a very interesting and very painful experience. Mm-hmm. Because on the one hand, I wanted to see just how stupid it would go. But at the other side, it's like, I, for, for all their many flaws, and there are many, uh, I actually liked the story of Resident Evil for what it was. And just a goofy monster story that is just incredibly crazy and whatever the writers want it to be at any given time. Mm -hmm. So to say my expectations were low would be a a bit of an, bit of an understatement. Yeah. However, in this film, Mila Jovovich plays the main character who I didn't even realize she like had a name until the movie was almost over. Oh yes. Captain Artemis. Yes. Captain Artemis. I yeah. don't even know and if she has a first name because they just call her captain. And then I didn't even realize. I, I want to say, I think on the dog tag, it says Natalie, but I could be wrong. Yeah. Um, so I'm just going to keep calling her Artemis for the rest of this, just to make sure yeah. there's going to be someone in the comments who corrects me. I'm sure. se- I mean, that seems fair. I mean, yeah, th- 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 like you were mentioning, we, we just saw it about an hour ago. And like you were mentioning in the car, it's like half the film, there really isn't any appreciable dialogue. So it's, it's a forgivable thing, I, I think, anyway. Yeah. And basically, it starts off with this military group just uh, doing something that's very unclear, and there's a lot of implied character backgrounds. They don't go anywhere. Don't get attached to these characters. They all die in the first 20 minutes. I was about to say, I think it's assumed that they're supposed to be in, like, Afghanistan, just doing, like, a routine patrol, because it's... Oh no! What they're what they're doing is they were doing a routine patrol, but then remember they had Bravo team that disappeared because they went into the the weird weather phenomenon, right? And so they're looking for Bravo team, but yeah, they're just kind of in Afghanistan, like who are doing military stuff? Oh yeah, yeah. And and there's, I mean, there's definitely a, you get a sense of camaraderie among them. So I thought maybe like. Mila Jovovich and one other were going to make it, but no, they, they all end up room temperature in the opening moments of the film. And we don't waste a lot of time getting into it either. No. And to her credit as a captain, she actually does kind of keep her people together because a lot of them start cracking. Yep. Okay. So, so when the monster hunter stuff kicks in, shall we say, uh, she, she's actually a pretty capable leader. Because her people start cracking, and she's like, no, you got to st- keep it together. We're soldiers. We fight. That's what we do. We're going to survive. And, well, I mean, she survives. <laughs> but, I mean, it's, this is not like a Commander Holdo situation where she's just kind of like, oh, well, I'm a commander. La, 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 la. No, she's actually, I'd argue she's pretty good. And she kind of exudes that she has experience in that. And then we meet kind of our deuteragonist. Uh, Who literally in the credits is named Hunter. We literally do not get a name for this guy. Well, because the entire thing is, and this is a thing that I, I actually am kind of ambivalent on, or not ambivalent, kind of uh, conflicted on, rather. I'm sorry. Um, because you have to remember, in the games, they for up until World, which is the most recent one, they never actually spoke in a language that you understood. They had their own language that Capcom actually made for the games, most times it was just kind of a ma ma or a ha ha or hi or whatever, just for the characters. And, um, but it was understood to be their own language. So when uh, Artemis is there, she can't communicate with Hunter, even if they're both trying to fight the same, you know, animals. So you kind of have this really weird, like, just chunk right in the middle of the movie where there's not really that much dialogue. It's an interesting character development, and it's very kind of auteur, but I don't know. I thought it was in, – in, it, on one hand, I can't really fault him because it's like this is actually, you know, a, a good nod to that the way the, the games are. But on the other hand, I'm like, out of all the things that you could have kept from the from the games, you kept the fact that he's speaking in, in uh, his own language, really. Weirder still, like – it seems like there's going to be some kind of mini arc where they're teaching each other the language mm-hmm. because there, there's little moments where they'll pick up a word. 
Like whenever he mentions a monster name, she pretty much picks up on it immediately for you know convenience for the audience. So you'll notice he says it in the Japanese. He says their Japanese names because he, has, if I remember right, he's like uh, Ratalos. And she's like, Rathalos. It's like, yeah. nah. Well, he, he says it with a Japanese accent. Uh, Rathalos's Japanese name is Leo Leis. But yeah. Uh, but yeah, he, he's like, Rathalos. And she goes, what's a Rathalos? And it's very clearly for the audience's benefit. Yeah. I mean, and that's that's probably, I think, my favorite part of the film is that it actually looks like the games. This isn't like an early X-Men you know, the, the X-Men 1 through 3 films where it's like, oh, they're kind of sort of looking like what the comics were. No, this is very, very faithful to the look and kind of atmosphere of the games. If anything, actually, the monsters, the beasts that you see are, I'd say, more threatening than they are in the games because a few of them that show up are kind of just mooks. They're kind of just punks that just are there like, oh, yeah, I have like one or two things that are kind of dangerous, but... I'm not really that dangerous. And uh, they're like presented in a really threatening way. So uh, it also kind of goes to show that even monsters you take for granted could be dangerous to someone who doesn't know what they're doing. I, I mean, I don't know. I'd argue that even if, for instance, the minigun that they have is just basic level one ammunition, the amount of bullets they throw at some of them would eventually kill them. <laughs> that is that is absolutely true. I mean, they 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 encounter Diablos and they hit that thing a bunch of times. Like a million times. Yeah. And it's like even light bow guns hitting it a million times would that, that would kill it. Or, and, and I mean, to be to its credit, they actually like showed its uh, horns getting broken. Yep. Which I thought was a nice, once again, this film is full of little fan service bits like that. But I mean, it would have killed the thing. Although, I mean, you were mentioning earlier that it could very well have been a Black Diablos. I didn't really see that, but... The, the lighting on it was really weird and inconsistent, but its scales looked black to me. Now, it could have just been a regular Diablos that just happened to have really intense shading to make it look more intense, which is fair, and I could totally see them doing that. But as tough as that thing was, it might as well have been a Black Diablos. <laughs> Yeah, that's true. And, and we get this this kind of arc where Hunter and Artemis kind of have to figure out how to work together without actually being able to communicate properly. And you see these moments where, like, mm -hmm. he cuts off a, a Nursala stinger and he fashions it into this spear harpoon thing. And she, like, gets armor for herself and, and shows them making and training with their weapons. That felt very, very much in line with how the games go. It was just really, really refreshing to see that. No, I mean, not only that, they, they, there's a lot of fan service to the games. Uh, they, they actually have, for instance, she picks up some twin blades and she goes into her demon mode. Yep. Where her weapons even start to, to catch fire because they look like uh, Rathalos blades. The, the chief later on. He starts using the uh, a switch axe hunter art from Generations. Yep. I mean, never mind the fact that yeah, once again, like uh, Artemis gets the uh, grapple gun slash uh, the bow gun, the, the little wrist bow gun. Yeah, the the, the arm mounted shot thing. I, I forget what it's called. The the arm slingshot from uh, Generations. Never. And on top of the fact that the palico, the one palico in the movie, is basically the, <laughs> the chef palico from literally the chef from World. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, they're, they're, like I said, it's really good in ca kind of capturing the feel of the film. And on top of that, I mean, I have to kind of, uh, I, I have to give them credit to this. I honestly thought because Hunter had a point where he was kind of like praying to these like totems of what turns out to be his family. And I'm like, oh, oh, for Christ's sakes, they're going to make him like a caveman or something. Yeah. And for those of you not in the know, Monster Hunter looks like it might be just a bunch of oog cavemen, but it's actually a post-post-apocalyptic world whereupon there used to be high technology, but because of this ancient war between the Wyvarian elf-like people and the Elder Dragons, the world was basically all the technology was ruined, but civilization and society and people have actually climbed up to that, up to the point where people now have to put conservation effects in place so that they don't over hunt certain monsters. Hunters are so effective now that they actually will have to stop 
hunting. Yep. That, that's how they are. And, um, it's not like, oh, cavemen. And yeah, I mean, yeah, there are hunters, but it's not about like, oh, I'm hunting for meat and more about the fact that the resources and just like the scales and stuff that they get from these animals are so effective and so good that material science that they can do with mere metal and stone and everything just does not compare. <clears throat> so I thought that that was really cool. I mean, it's a low fantasy world with some steampunk trappings. Like one of the very first things you see is them using one of the sand ships from uh, Monhun 4. And it's a really nice effect. It actually looks real. It looks like something straight out of the game, except that, like it's human actors. Honestly, I thought they were going to have a, uh, one of the giant elder dragons, the, the giant like sandworm ones, like uh, Darain Moran or Jen Moran show up. I, I had hoped they would, but I'm getting the sense that, that they get, feel that this will be successful enough to merit at least a sequel or two. So they might be saving the big guys for like the third film when they can do something really explosive. That's true. And I mean, it is very clearly left on a cliffhanger considering that, you know, they just show him a boy, Gora Magala. <laughs> and um, I, I have a special place in my heart for Gora Magala and Shigaro Magala because my, once again, I said my first, my first game in the series was four ultimate. And those guys figure very heavily into four ultimate story. And they just kind of like, Oh, here he is, and then they just kind of end the film. So yeah, they sort of tease him. But as I was saying earlier, uh, before we started recording, I think that's actually a great idea because the entire frenzy virus lends itself to a perfectly suitable uh, plot hook mm-hmm. for a theoretical sequel. Yeah, and if there is a theoretical sequel, I will go see it. I, I will say that right now. I think it's worth seeing. Yeah, I mean, my one if, if we're so we've been kind of gushing at this point, but I, I want to say like my one right like one thing that I think detracts from the film is the fact that they start with this weird isekai like oh we have soldiers and they get isekai'd into monster into Monhun world. I don't know why they did this. I mean, the only thing I could think of is it's the entire oh well these these are viewpoint characters because. I mean, not for nothing. Monhun is more popular than it was even when I got into it six years ago. Yeah. But, um, or I mean, even before you got into it there, uh, Professor, what, uh, eight years ago? Yeah, thereabouts. Uh, Yeah, because that would be Try. Uh, Yeah, three three ultimate, three ultimate, yeah. Yeah, that sounds about right. Um, But anyways, so, but it's still a niche game. Hunting games of the type that, like, Monhun, Toki Den... God Eater, these are still pretty niche, even amongst, you know, the kind of weeaboo Japanese, you know, JRPG type crowd, because it requires a lot of grinding and a lot of dedication to like, look, I want to get this particular set or this particular effect on my gear. And that requires a lot of work. Yeah, that's why I think why why World has gotten so popular is it cuts the grinding down a lot. And there's a lot of quality of life improvements for newcomers. Yeah, I don't know. I just, I really like the way Generations was. And just the fact that they made it like go from, I can backflip literally off everything to now. (laughs) Cool, blimey. Now there's the giant engine off right there. Well, see, I I like both those things. I actually like the the tracking aspects. Like I wish they just bring the the arts style backs uh, that that's, Good grammar. They kind of they kind of do, as I understand it. Like, sort of. For instance, the long the long sword, my baby. Uh, she still has the giant ash, like nothing personnel kid, like <laughs> drop slash you can do. But I mean, yeah, you can't. For instance, just do the backflip off everything like you can <laughs> in uh, generations. Yeah, and my complaint uh, specifically with the film. Um, the first half of the film is a slow burn. Oh, yeah, definitely. And I mean a very, very, very slow burn. They take a lot of time. There's this whole setup in the quote-unquote real world, which doesn't pay off. So that could have been cut entirely. Then we have you know, uh, uh, Artemis fall into the world of Monster Hunter, and... They get terrorized by a colony of Nursala, and that just bugs me. And that that was a pun, and I didn't even mean for it to be. Well, no, no, they're not bugs because they're spiders. <laughs> they're, they're Come not. on, Professor, you're you're a bugaboo. Technically not bugs, you know. Um, <laughs> and more than that, they're uh, solitary hunters. Uh-huh. Nursala's nest solo, and they only ever go to seek out their own kind during mating season. Okay, I have to ask. I have to ask. What what are what are the 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 giant water scorpion ones? The 
those ones are actually social. I forget what they're called. Um, I'm drawing a blank, to be honest. Yeah, because there's the males, which are like the weird flying ones, and then the females would actually go out of their way to hunt down and kill the males. Oh, the, uh, the, and they're um, like the rhino beetle looking ones. Yeah, those. I should know this. I actually had that armor in generations. This is going to bug me, and um, until I until I <laughs> yeah, now, okay, that's a pun. <laughs> that I really didn't mean that either time. See, they could you know you know what they you know what I thought originally the Narsala were. What's that? I thought that they were actually the Giginox from Monster Hunter Tri slash Three Ultimate. Yeah, and honestly, that would have been more terrifying given how awful those things are. Yeah, and see that makes sense too because those are social. They actually do lay their their young inside living prey. Yeah, like huge honeycomb looking things. And on top of that, they're horrifying gross little alien monsters. That would be perfect for that sort of thing, but it wasn't. It was Nersala and Yeah, and there, there's eh. thousands of Nersala, some of them being much, much smaller than we're used to seeing. Yeah, because a Nersala is about the size of a horse. Yeah. And yeah, th- some of them were like up to like uh, the soldier's knees or so. Th- these are not. Yeah, some of them were, were very much clearly supposed to be immature specimens because of mm-hmm. the biggest Nersalas you could encounter were, were quite large. <laughs> so like they could eat some uh, smaller flying wyverns, and they did. Because uh, I think it actually says they did prey on. Um, not Giginox, but the other one, its cousin. Gypseros. Oh, yeah, Gyp- yeah, it's Gypseros. They did eat Gypseros. That's why they lived in the same caves. Yeah. And so that kind of bugged me uh, specifically because it's like they're not, they weren't colony creatures. And it's weird that they kind of made them that way. Um, but then there's it's really clever bit where the hunter's like, oh, it's, you know, we take the poison stinger from Nursala to use as a weapon against Diablos. Mm -hmm. And he's actually thinking the way a hunter would think, taking the uh, resources from one and using it to exploit another. Although not going to lie, when he did that, uh, I actually really liked that segment. Of course, the inner hunter in me was like, yeah, they got it. It's now asleep. Now, (laughs) then you got to get the big barrel (laughs) bomb. Exactly. (laughs) Sleep bomb. Yeah. But they didn't do that. Although, not going to lie, when they, they did use a pitfall trap on the Nursala that they uh, killed, and uh, it actually did kind of fall into it and start to like struggle like they do in the games. I'm like, wow, that's a, once again, the, the level of detail in this in this is really, really good. Oh, yeah, the monsters look freaking fantastic. I, I mean, and it's, and it's not just the monsters, the uh, like the later hunters that they encounter. A bunch of them actually have recognizable armor sets, and uh, it's like, wow, I cannot believe I'm saying this, but like, you guys did really good on this. Yeah, no, the, the costume design, the monster design, the, the movie looks fantastic. And I, like I said, I think if they trimmed down that first half, made it a bit more brisk to get it to like the training segment and like fashioning her own weapons and armor. And stuff like that. Um, mm-hmm. I, I think they would have a very solid. Uh, I think we both agreed that B minus was a perfectly fair score for this film. Uh, yeah. Oh. And, oh. Another thing. Another thing we forgot. We forgot. What's that? They the music was kind of lackluster. They didn't use ah, any of the music yes. from the series. Uh, either proof of a hero, go forth, young hunters. I mean, I don't even think they actually even used Diabolus' theme. They did not. It was all uh, music. Like, at the very start of the film, they're listening to George Jones, and I'm like, listen, I grew up in a classic country household when it comes to music choice. George Jones and Monster Hunter are not meant for one another. <laughs> I don't know. I could I could think of a few people playing Leonard Skinner while <laughs> using the, uh, the, the great, um, the big bow gun. You know, you, you just put on Sweet Home Alabama and you just light up a Rathalos. No, no, okay, you, you, you raise a very fair and interesting point there. <laughs> also, the monster you were talking about earlier is the Seltos, and it's in the Neop. Uh, see, I knew it was an S name. I just, I could not remember. Yeah. Seltos, and it's from the uh, Neopteran family. Yeah. And, and um, okay, here's the thing, Capcom. I am a huge dork for games that actually go out of their way to like classify their monsters by species and categories the way monster hunter does keep doing that that's that's good stuff nerds like me will eat that up and the more there is to read on it the more engaged we'll get oh yeah it's weird there's it it kind of uh monhun kind of has the dark souls situation where it's like there is a 
boatload of lore, but unless you're really looking for it, unless you go into like the hunting logs for like all the different monsters and see what their taxonomy is, what their relationships to one another are, Mm -hmm. you won't really encounter much of it, which is a shame. But at the same time though, I guess you go in as deep as you want. Yeah. And that's the fun thing about monster hunter is it has lore. Some of it you have to go hunt for, um, so to speak. And I'm just like dropping terrible puns left and right. And I'm swear I'm not doing it on purpose. You know what? I was letting, gonna let that one slide, (laughs) but okay. Not even doing it on purpose. I, I swear. But like the movie actually kind of plays on that idea. And um, let's enter spoiler mode. Cog, could you drop the spoiler warning there for us, my good man? Warning. It is a non stop spoiler onslaught going forward. Abandon all pretenses, ye who enter here. <laughs> and that in mind, uh, we see this thing called the Sky Tower, which is supposedly due to mechanisms within the tower and the geothermal energy of the area and the lightning storms that it perpetuates can rip open bar- uh, pa- passageways through space and time between the two worlds. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, okay, that's fair because there's some weird stuff in the world of Monster Hunter. Yeah. And so that's not even outside the realm of possibility. Yeah. A lot of the technology that the Wavarians uh, cl- lay claim to is some pretty magical stuff, especially. Mm-hmm. So it, that's not surprising to me, but I don't know. It's the entire isekai thing just didn't sit well with me. It didn't, it didn't need to be an isekai. And, and while very artistic and very interesting for a film to go a very long time without any in the way of dialogue, it can become frustrating because I did want to know more about the hunter because mm-hmm. you see, he has a ton of personality. Oh yeah, he does. Like, there's even a bit where he, uh, they go up to some Apteroth who are drinking water from this like uh, little pond, and uh, Artemis is like, "Oh, thank God, some water!" And he kind of motions for her to go ahead, and this um, one of those little sand shark creatures, I forget their name, jumps out at her, and he just like decapitates it in one go, and he points at her and is like, "Bait!" And she's like, "Oh, oh, thanks. I see how it is." <laughs> that yeah. was genuinely hilarious to me. Yeah. No, yeah. I mean, the fact that, yeah, not just that, but like the guy is tough as nails. He gets stabbed and he literally just, you know, gets back up and just starts railing on uh, her when they first meet. Yeah. When they're first fighting. Yeah. And on on top of that, like he actually puts himself in danger on multiple occasions in order to keep these small totems he has of his, his dead family. Like with him. Yeah. And I, I think that's interesting because we, we get to see kind of like a- aspects of a religious theme in, in uh, the monster hunter world, which we don't normally get. So we see kind of this aspect of hunter culture that we normally wouldn't get to see. And I wish they had expanded on that because the idea was fascinating. Honestly, I, I feel, and this is just kind of, you know, me being an armchair cinematographer, honestly, if they had had, her be the main character, you know, Milia Jovovich be the main character and kind of the viewpoint hunter of like a hunting party that needs to go to the sky tower in order to investigate it. And she just comes from, you know, like podunk Moga village or whatever that I think would have been better. You wouldn't have had the, you know, really auteur like sans dialogue chunk right in the second in the middle. And, um, you still would have been able to have, you know, kind of the fish out of water aspect. I'd argue. I mean, she's, she's, I don't know. I I feel like that would have been better and uh, it would have allowed people who are not really familiar with the, uh, with the franchise to kind of dip their toes in and not be like, Oh God, what is all these weird dinosaurs and these people with giant anime weapons attacking them. (laughs) And then we wouldn't have had to have all like the, you know, oh, here's all these military people. Oh, they don't matter. They literally all die. Literally don't matter. And we don't even get like 
their, their plot lines go nowhere and they don't end up adding anything to the story. It's like, why was this even an isekai story to begin with? Just mm-hmm. like, like Yutaku suggested, have her come from some nowhere place. Like you could even have a little like a uh, reference. Like, Oh yeah, she comes from Moga Island. She has no idea what the mainland's like. Mm-hmm. And, and you'd have a, a little shout out to three there and you can go like straight into the action without having to have the sky tower set up. Although, not going to lie, the way they kill the Rathalos at the end with the fact that the, that Hunter just unloads on the Rathalos. <laughs> by the way, the final boss is a Rathalos. And he just unloads on it with blast arrows. I'm like, damn, is this three ultimate? I mean, this guy might as well be wielding <laughs> a Kelby bow. Because he's just like, choo, 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 choo. Yeah. That's, yeah, I was about to say, that's some Kelby bow shenanigans. So you kill the final boss in like less than 10 seconds. Yeah, he just unloads like five blast arrows on him and he just blows him the f out. There, that's my one one bad word for the review. <laughs> but I mean, he did BTFO him, so. Oh, no, he absolutely did. <laughs> there was no doubt about that. Yeah. So yeah, you said uh, about B- yeah. I, I'd argue about B minus is is fair for this. B minus is fair, and if a sequel comes around, I would go see it. I was impressed with this, and you know, Paul W S Anderson is no longer you know uttered in the same sentence as the likes of Uva Bowl. You are now above that, you know, and I, and I hope that you continue to rise above that. And, and I, there's very clearly potential for more here. Mm-hmm. No, definitely, definitely. I think the uh, the level of detail that they kind of put into this. I don't know if that was uh, Anderson himself or if this was Capcom being like, no, no, this is going to look like Monster Hunter if nothing else. Oh yeah, uh, definitely. Oh, and I mean, uh, to its credit, I don't remember a lot of the trailer bits that you and I were kind of shaking our heads at actually being in the cut of this cut of the film. So. Yeah, they they focused a lot on like moments that would have been in like the movie's opening 15 minutes, but it seems like even that got chopped down a little bit. Yeah. So, uh, all in all, you know, I, I, it's not a good film, but it's not the train wreck. I thought it was going to be, which is weird. It's a good, it's a good popcorn muncher to watch with friends. And honestly, in this time where there is kind of a dearth of movies, I'd say it's worth the investment to go see it in theaters. If you get the chance. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for having me. Professor, it's always a pleasure. Certainly, it was a pleasure having you with me, both for the film and the review. Yeah, I had fun. We should do this more often. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, <laughs> actually, bother going to the movies. We'll see what we can do. All righty. <laughs> All right, everyone. This is Ditaku and the Hipster Snack signing off for now. Bye, bye, everybody. Hey, everyone. Thanks for watching. And if you're still watching, I just wanted to let you guys know that I wanted to extend a big thank you. To all my viewers for helping us recently break the 250 subs milestone. That is crazy to me. The fact that we did it so quickly is all thanks to you and you guys supporting me. And it means the world to me. So I want to give a little something back in return. Between now and the time we hit the 500 subs mark, both on my YouTube discussion page tab and over at my Twitter at Hipster Snack, there is now an open AMA or Ask Me Anything where you guys can ask as many questions as you want. When we hit the 500 subs mark, I will sit down and make the video and answer every question that doesn't get me banned off YouTube. The posts are already there and pinned, awaiting your input. I'm curious to see what you guys are curious about. So I'll see you at the 500 subs mark with all the answers that you've been craving. And I will see you there.